This is what China's capital of manufacturing, Shenzhen, looked like in 1980. A backwater fishing village in one of the poorest economies in the world. And this is what it looks like today. To me, this clearly demonstrates the power of China's incredible economic miracle. A miracle that lifted more than 800 million people out of poverty in just 40 years. However, if you turn on the news right now, this is what you'll typically hear. The world's second largest economy is stumbling and the alarm is sounding across the globe at China's worsening economic outlook. That's due to worsening a worsening property slump, weak consumer spending and tumbling credit growth. They just stopped releasing youth jobless data because it's so bad. Is the economy in China in danger of a serious ongoing downward spiral? So what happened? How did China get so powerful so quickly? Why is its economy then in trouble now? And are its troubles so bad that China is no longer expected to overtake the USA as the world's preeminent superpower? The standard story is that China got rich by abandoning communism in 1978 and is now wasting its chance to become a superpower by turning back to authoritarian communism. But that story has always seemed overly simplistic to me. After all, there are many countries like, for example, Russia, that also abandoned communism and did not get so powerful. Similarly, there are countries that have always been more open, like, for example, India, that also didn't get as powerful so quickly as China. Finally, if you look closer, China's economic miracle looks an awful lot like that of Japan and other East Asian nations like Korea and Singapore, even though China has never been as open as these countries. So to find out the real story, I spent weeks reading the research from renowned China experts like Professor Michael Petters, Dr. Yi Wen and Dr. Zhang Yuan Zoe Liu. And I then combined their insights with those of development economists like Nobel Prize winner Simon Kuznets and Professor Ha Yun Chang. And now I'm very happy to report that I believe that I finally found a story that connects all of the dots. The story that can explain how China got so powerful, why it is now stagnating and, importantly, what we can expect will happen to China's economy next. Will it overtake the USA as the reigning global superpower or will it stagnate like Japan did after the 1980s? To answer that question, let's get into the story right away by answering how China escaped poverty. Okay, this story starts in 1978 when Deng Xiaoping became the de facto leader of China. He inherited one of the poorest economies in the world, one that has been stagnant for decades and was even being outperformed by economies like Sudan and Haiti. And yet, as we all know today, China is the second largest economy in the world, leaving Sudan and Haiti and many others in the dust when it comes to GDP per person. In between 1978 and today, China was radically transformed from an agricultural society into the world's manufacturing hub, with a manufacturing output today that matches that of Europe and the United States combined. And even more impressively, the country now dominates advanced industries ranging from telecommunications to electric vehicles to solar panels. So how did it do this? What is the secret sauce that it used to achieve this miracle? To answer this complicated question, I first tried to find out how other economic miracles, such as those experienced by West European and North American countries, had come about throughout history. How did these economies grow rapidly to become the advanced economies that they are today? Well, according to a Nobel Prize winning economist, Simon Kuznets, the type of rapid economic growth that all of these countries went through was actually characterized by two key characteristics. The first was rapidly rising productivity per person. In other words, these countries were primarily able to make more stuff because people got better at making more stuff, rather than just by having more people in your economy. The second key characteristic Kuznets found was that these economies first shifted from being dominated by agriculture to being dominated by industry and then 
after they industrialized, they eventually became dominated by the service industry. A process that economists typically refer to as structural transformation. And while today some countries have tried to develop by focusing on services right away, their growth has never actually been as impressive as the Asian development miracles experienced by Japan, Korea, Taiwan and Singapore. Now, according to development economists like Cambridge's professor Ha Yun Cheng, the reason for this is that while agriculture has been constrained by nature and services by human nature, people in the manufacturing sector have been able to become much more productive through automation. On top of that, manufacturing goods can more easily be exported. So if you focus on manufacturing as a developing nation, you can develop faster because you can export to countries that are already rich, making you richer. However, as noted by Dr. Yi Wen in his book, The Making of an Economic Superpower, Unlocking China's Secret of Rapid Industrialization, the path to prosperity does not end there. You see, in line with Kuznets' observation, even today all rich countries then transition further from a manufacturing economy to a service-oriented economy. Now, I realize that this second transition might seem counterintuitive, so we'll dive deeper into that in detail in the second part of this video. But first, knowing now that most economic miracles came about by becoming a manufacturing power, I think we can already answer our question about how China dragged itself out of poverty by stating that it did so by making its people more productive by becoming a manufacturing powerhouse. Which of course, doesn't really say much, as it then raises the question, how did China become a manufacturing powerhouse? Which gets us to the standard story that China became a manufacturing powerhouse by abandoning communism and embracing globalization. And sure, this story makes a lot of sense at first. After all, while under communism, China only made limited progress in manufacturing, and it was only after Deng Xiaoping opened up China to market forces and the outside world, slowly via special economic zones, that China's economic miracle kicked off. So it makes sense that this is often where the standard story stops. Economic growth was simply a matter of opening up to the world. But while I agree that it is a crucial first step, I never felt satisfied with that simple explanation alone. After all, if escaping poverty was as simple as doing nothing, you'd surely have a lot more wealthy countries. More importantly, this simplistic narrative is not in line with historical evidence of substantial government intervention in East Asian states like Japan, Singapore and Korea. Heck, even if you dive into the history of the economic development of the United States, you'll discover that the first US Secretary of Treasury, Alexander Hamilton, never believed the British free market economists of the time, as he wrote that in countries where there is great private wealth, much may be affected by the voluntary contribution of patriotic individuals. But in a community situated like that of the United States, the public purse must supply the deficiency of private resources in what can be so useful as in prompting and improving the efforts of industry. Which means in simpler terms that in a poor developing nation, which the US was at the time, the government must actively stimulate industrial development. So what did the government of successfully developing nations did to transform their economies and stimulate industry? Well, according to Professor Michael Pettis from Peking University, the Chinese government indeed roughly followed the same development model as America, Japan and the East Asian tiger economies did before it. A model that he classifies as the investment-driven growth model. To illustrate how this model works, let's have a look at the story of Shenzhen, which in the 1980s was just a fishing village, whose only advantages were that it had low labor costs and was situated next to the bustling metropolis of Hong Kong. In May 1980, it became the first special economic zone created by Deng Xiaoping. This meant that unlike in the rest of China, foreign businesses could now set up shop here and the Chinese made it extra attractive by promising them 
lax labor regulations and tax breaks. So, as you might have noticed, that part is actually still in line with the traditional opening up story. However, there were then three key problems holding Shenzhen back from truly becoming an attractive destination for foreign firms and domestic entrepreneurs alike. And to really understand this, I think it is helpful to think about it from a perspective of a Chinese entrepreneur that, for example, wanted to start a car company in Shenzhen. First of all, while it is great that you can have cheap workers there for your factory, you can clearly see that this small fishing village does not currently have the infrastructure needed for your massive factories. Most obviously, there are not enough houses for all of your workers, there is not enough electricity and, yeah, clearly these sandy roads cannot facilitate the hundreds of trucks that will help you bring the goods to the harbor of Hong Kong. And even if all of this infrastructure was already here, you'd run into a second problem, which is about where you will find the money to build a big factory in dirt poor China. Finally, you realize that even if you are able to get the money, you will still not be able to compete with the big Japanese and German car makers, which have specialized knowledge and big existing factories. Luckily for our entrepreneur though, China implemented a version of the investment-led growth model, which was built around three pillars that aimed to solve these three problems with clever government interventions. Now, the first key pillar of this growth model is that the economy was reshaped to facilitate investment in infrastructure. Not only was the local government instructed to build the necessary infrastructure, such as electricity, water and roads to the port of neighboring Hong Kong, it was also given the incentive to do so by tying its revenue to the value of the land in the district. However, given that China was one of the world's poorest countries, they then still ran into a problem. How to pay for this initial infrastructure? Well, this is where the second key pillar of the investment-driven growth model comes in. You see, to pay for infrastructure, as well as for the factories themselves and the required equipment from abroad, you basically need two types of money, local money and foreign money, which is basically US dollars. Now, local money is in theory infinitely available since the central bank can just print it. However, given that this could be inflationary, most countries have outsourced the business of money creation to private banks who create money as debt. This means that banks can create debt that is hopefully used to make factories that produce stuff and therefore will not be inflationary and will not increase debt to GDP because it increases GDP. However, to make sure that this is indeed what the debt money is used for, China used the same trick as Japan did by forcing banks to create credit only for sectors that it thought were productive, such as, in China's case, housing and manufacturing. On top of that, China's central bank and state banks purposefully kept interest rates low, encouraging investment by entrepreneurs. Second, now let's talk about foreign money. To ensure that the right type of foreign money would flow in, China restricted speculative money flows and encouraged direct investment in factories. And while foreigners needed to share some power and technology with the locals when they wanted to build a factory in China, this was still very attractive for them, given that there was such good infrastructure and that wages were kept purposefully low. You see, thanks to the registration system that is known in China as the Huku system, if you work in a city like Shenzhen, but you are not originally from that city, then yes, you can live and work in that city, but you don't have access to crucial social services such as education and healthcare. Now, as noticed by people like Professor Pettis, a crucial side effect of this system is that it entices workers to accept lower pay and crappier jobs, as this system makes them much more vulnerable. And on the flip side, this means that entrepreneurs, like our friend, can more easily exploit these workers. Of course, this is terrible for ordinary workers, but in line with China's investment-driven growth model, it helped keep wages and workers' rights low, and therefore China an attractive destination for foreign investment in factories. So now, fast forward a couple of years and Shenzhen had the money and infrastructure to attract enough firms to become a major manufacturing hub. 
However, the problem was for an advanced industry like cars that the knowledge gap just appeared too big. And while China did develop a local industry, it wasn't able to compete with the Japanese and the Germans on the international market for decades to come. However, as you might have heard, China has recently overtaken both Japan and Germany to become the biggest car exporter in the world, which brings us to the third and final pillar of the investment-led growth model, and that is infant industry protection. Okay, the basic idea is that in very advanced industries, there are many barriers that prevent companies from entering them. So for example, our car entrepreneur in Shenzhen might have access to cheap workers, good infrastructure, loans, and know-how, but he still could not compete with Western car makers because they had far too much knowledge. So to upgrade the Chinese economy, the Chinese aimed to protect their young sectors from international competition while letting them compete amongst themselves and therefore have the time to learn. So how did they protect their industries? Well, the most obvious way was to use import tariffs. So for example, if a European manufacturer wanted to export to China in the 1980s, it could expect to pay 50% to the Chinese state for the privilege. But as Chinese industries matured, the country lowered tariff rates. And indeed, because China isn't super rich yet, Chinese tariffs are still generally higher than those in advanced economies. For example, today, our Chinese car entrepreneur friend, who's gotten really rich, still only pays roughly 10% to export a Chinese-made car to Europe, while his competition in Europe would pay between 15 to 25% to export a car to China. However, before you get mad at China, I have to say that this is normal in our current trading system, where advanced economies accept that developing countries have higher tariffs, precisely so that they can develop. But there are more ways that China helped their domestic infant industries. For example, if we stick with our friend in the car industry, he got a running start because China required that all foreign car makers that wanted to sell cars in China did so in a joint venture with a local entrepreneur. Something that was very profitable for all parties involved at first, but is now causing some headaches in European boardrooms as our entrepreneurial friend started his own car company after having learned all the tricks of the trade from his previous European partner. Crucially though, China did not fall into the trap that many African nations fell into, and that is protecting your infant industries from all competition. You see, if China had done that, our friend may have just gotten lazy and his company would never have been able to compete globally. So to prevent that outcome, China let its infant industry firms compete ruthlessly amongst themselves. And as a consequence, the Chinese firms learned quickly. And so just like America and Japan before it, China was able to complete its transformation from agriculture economy to manufacturing powerhouse, thanks to indeed opening up its economy, while at the same time the government pursued the investment-led growth model with its three key pillars of investing in infrastructure, setting up an effective financial system, and employing infant industry protection. And so you'd expect China to just be continuing to catch up to America and Japan. However, now we have all of this bad news about. That's due to worsening, a worsening property slump, weak consumer spending and tumbling credit growth. They just stopped releasing youth jobless data because it's so bad. Is the economy in China in danger of a serious ongoing downward spiral? Which raises the question, if this was such a good model, then why did China's growth model stop working? Well, that is something we will get into after talking about online data. You see, while China's government wields overwhelming control, elsewhere it's big tech knowing you inside out, gathering data about you via your phone, desktop, browser and email. But do you enjoy being tracked by one party? Well. I know that I don't. Luckily, today's sponsor, Tuta, offers you a way to shield the core of your digital identity, your email address, away from the prying eyes of big tech. You see, if you use Tuta, everything's encrypted automatically. Your messages, files, and even your calendar. 
In fact, Tuta is so secure that it is blocked by the Chinese government. Unlike Gmail, Outlook and other big tech email providers though, there are no complex procedures to turn this all on. It is the default. The reason is that unlike big tech, Tuta does not make money by collecting your data or serving you annoying targeted ads. Instead, they offer a premium account that allows multiple users, custom domains, alias, email addresses and more. But luckily, all of Tuta's core, highly encrypted email services are completely free. So if you want to make it more difficult for big tech to collect data about you, you can create a secure email account with Tuta today, using the link in the description of this video. It's super easy and doesn't even require a phone number. So hopefully you'll do that after hearing more about why China's growth model stopped working. Because let's face it, the news anchors actually have a point. Chinese economic growth has been rather disappointing the last few years, halting its progress towards superpower status. Many investors on Wall Street, for example, had expected economic growth to come roaring back after COVID. But just as people like Michael Pettis had been predicting all along, China's miracle growth did not come back, as China's investment-led economic growth model had actually already stopped working around 2007, when China's premier at the time, Wen Jibao, already said that its rapid economic growth had become unstable, unbalanced, uncoordinated and unsustainable. And the reason was that China's economic growth relies too much on investment and export. And therefore the solution should be that rather than boosting investment further, China should have switched to boost domestic consumption. Which means that China's leader at the time seemingly intended to follow the development economics of Simon Kuznets by boosting consumer growth, which should then lead to a bigger service sector. Now, to understand why that switch is actually needed, I think it is important to keep in mind that as an economy becomes dominated by services, this does not mean that manufacturing output decreases. For example, as you can see here, while manufacturing output grew faster in China, it still grew in the United States. Similarly, as China transitioned from an agricultural economy to a manufacturing-based economy, its food production still kept rising. So one way of looking at economic growth is more that it's sort of a tower where each layer builds on the next. You have to have enough food first before you build a manufacturing industry and you need to have a manufacturing industry before you build a thriving service sector on top of it. Because the thing with agriculture as well as manufacturing is the better you get at it, the fewer people you need to make food and products. So if you just stick to these two activities exclusively, you are going to end up with a lot of unemployed people. But then who will buy all of these products? Well, in advanced economies, the people buying food and manufactured stuff are mostly those people that work in the service industry, like me. For example, in the United Kingdom, while services account for 78% of the economy, the service sector actually employed 95% of all workers. So today, China's investment-driven model with its suppression of worker incomes and easy credit for factories and construction builders is actually holding China's economy back because it means that ordinary people simply do not have enough money to buy all the stuff that Chinese producers make. What's more, if ordinary people have more money, this means that they have a way to signal to firms what they need next and therefore what firms should be investing in next. Something that is sorely needed given the extreme state of malinvestment or bad investments in China. For example, some now estimate that enough housing has been built in China to accommodate 3 billion people. However, there are only 1.4 billion people in China and its population is set to shrink in the future. But crazy news like this now hopefully starts making more sense to you given that you now know that China has actually not changed its growth model since Wen Jibao's speech in 2007. This can also explain why we now see these 
ridiculous things such as gigantic mountains of electric vehicles or ride-sharing bikes that nobody has bought. And it can also explain why China's trade surplus has just kept going up. It's not just that Chinese products are so good. It is also that Chinese people are still too poor to buy everything that the country produces. It can even explain China's massive housing bubble. You see, the investment-led growth model kept interest rates low. And combine that with the fact that local governments had to make sure that the land values kept going up to keep paying for all of that new infrastructure that they kept building and building. And you'll see that they actually had a really big incentive to encourage the housing bubble as rising housing prices meant that people would keep on buying more housing units even though they wouldn't live in them. And while the scale of overproduction in China is really exceptional, I don't think we've seen anything like this before, the situation itself is not unique. If you look at the history of investment-led growth models, you'll see that many of these rapid development miracles ended in a bubble followed by a crisis or by stagnation. For example, after rapidly growing in the 19th century, America's economy crashed after its stock market bubble popped in the 1930s. Similarly, Japan's rapid economic growth in the 60s and 70s was followed by a massive housing bubble and stock market bubble in the 1980s, which then popped and led to three decades of stagnation starting in the 1990s. So is China's economy heading towards a similar fate? And will that look like a USA-style depression? Or will it look like a Japan-style stagnation? In other words, what's next? for China. Will China be able to make the switch to a modern economy and reach superpower status as it transitions to a sustainable growth model that fosters a thriving service sector alongside agriculture and manufacturing? Or will the country keep pushing and pushing the investment-led growth model until it breaks? Well, in my research I've basically found three scenarios. First, I found some economists which have pointed out that in theory there's actually still a lot of reason for optimism for China's economy. After all, China's population is only at 20% of the wealth of the United States and so there's still just a lot of room for growth. What's more, unlike Japan's government in the 1990s, China's government does actually recognize that it needs to boost consumption and that its current growth is unsustainable. However, according to Professor Pettis, this optimistic scenario is unlikely because of politics. You see, while switching to a more sustainable growth model is the best option for the Chinese people, it will mean that the owners of heavy industry and the construction industry give up many of their privileges. And in China, these crucial sectors are largely controlled by the members of the Chinese Communist Party. And as recently said by Chinese economist Dr. Zhongyang Zui Liu on the Outlaws podcast, the Chinese Communist Party has always been at the center of a capital allocation. And by empowering the household, or for that matter, the private sector, mm -hmm. it basically dilute huh. or potentially remove their relevancy. In other words, it is not likely that the Chinese Communist Party is willing to actually give the power to households that is needed to develop a service sector and thereby lose some of its relative power in the economy. And this is why I think that it's likely that the investment-led growth model will not be radically reformed and therefore the unsustainable growth China has now will continue until it stops naturally either in the form of an economic collapse, as it did in the United States, or in the form of several lost decades, as it did in Japan. And given that China's financial system is state-controlled and therefore cannot collapse as the banks did in the United States, most economists I follow now believe that the stagnation scenario is the most likely, which means that the Chinese economy will have a difficult time catching up to the United States in the next few decades. In other words, China got out of poverty thanks to investment-led growth, but now, by clinging on to that model for too long, its growth has become unsustainable, and therefore it will likely not reach superpower status for the foreseeable future. But yeah, that's my take. Do you think the Chinese leadership will switch growth models, or do you think they are too invested in the current growth model that produces so much stuff that people don't need? 
Let me know in the comments below. And if you liked this style of video, which uses the insights of experts to tell a story that goes deeper than the standard narrative, then consider supporting my work by becoming a patron or member. Finally, if you want to know more about why I don't think that the Chinese collapse scenario is likely, check out this video over here. Or alternatively, if you want a positive story about China, check out this video over here about its car exporting miracle.